All right, welcome back everyone to the fourth Atmosphere keynote today. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Jason Chan and I'm serving as the chair of this year's Atmosphere Symposium at the Faculty of Architecture, University of Manitoba. This is our 14th annual symposium and we have invited a set of speakers to address the subtext living together again to question the status quo of uh, status quo ideas and issues of housing. Niraji Bhatia uh, kicked off uh, uh, as a first lecture with the notion of commune. Lois uh, Winthal discussed the edges of bubbles and Upama Kundu offered us to think about localizing and grounding strategies in housing and in, in approaching building in general. Today throughout, and to, uh, next, throughout next week, the keynotes are, um, and the discussion that will follow will continue to offer us opportunity to reflect on the idea of living together in our present and post pandemic worlds. As we begin today's program, we would like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Ashinabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dennett peoples, and on the homelands of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that, we, uh, that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities and in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Now, I would like to turn it over to Neil Manuk, a faculty member at the Department of Architecture and also the principal at DIN Projects. Neil in, will introduce the speaker today and also moderate the discussion after the lecture. Neil. Hey, thanks, Jay. And thanks for letting me introduce today's speaker. Um, Jing Liu was born in Nanjing, China, uh, and she went to school in China, Japan, uh, UK, and the United States. Um, in the early 2000s, she studied architecture um, uh, at Tulane in, in New Orleans. Um, and after completing um, architecture in, in Tulane, she moved to New York. Um, in 2008, she founded So Ill uh, with Dutch architect Florian Eidenberg. Um, they, uh, they, they started their, their practice out very, um, in a very sort of robust fashion by winning uh, the, the MoMA PS1 uh, Young Architects program, uh, like the, the real, the carrot that everyone sort of <laughs> really sort of tries to, tries to pull. Uh, it's a super prestigious prize. Um, and the project was sort of a fun project called Pole Dance, a highly experimental and interactive uh, structure installation. Um, everyone should know about, about the Young Architects Program and PS1. Um, so Il went on to design the award-winning uh, Kukji Gallery in, in Seoul, Korea. Uh, Kukji uh, is noteworthy for um, the ambiguous spatial edges that, that, that the project has. Uh, the project is somewhat tent-like. And uh, and the, these uh, and the, the morph morphology is is quite sort of complex and and um, and the edges are, are quite ambiguous. Um, in 2013, Soil won the competition design the Manetti Shrem uh, Museum of Art in uh, U, U California Davis, uh, a, a, a art museum that holds a bunch of Bruce Nauman. Uh, uh, works, uh, quite, quite an incredible museum, quite an incredible project that is also through, through its sort of roof form is somewhat uh, tent-like. Uh, so I'll have designed a number of excellent projects of various scales in a number of different locations, including Greece and France and, uh, and, and sort of all over the world. Um, uh, Jing has been a faculty member at Columbia, uh, the graduate program there since 2009. Uh, she's also taught at Syracuse and Park Parsons. Um, I should also note that Soil uh, curated uh, uh, an exhibition at uh, the CCA in Montreal uh, in 2015, uh, Landscapes of the Hyperreal. And uh, I, also interestingly, uh, Jing also serves on the board of the Van Allen Institute, a nonprofit New York institution that works to enhance the transformative power of design on its cities, landscapes, and regions in order to improve people's lives. Um, a really great, great pursuit. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Jing today. Uh, welcome, welcome virtually to Winnipeg. <laughs> Hi, 
Great, thank you very much, um, Jay and Neil, for the introduction and inviting me to be part of this uh, um, very, um, seems to be very dynamic and productive conversation of, and, and also very timely conversation of how do we uh, move forward at the living together in a collective way um, after we have been confined in our bubbles, the individual bubbles for so long. And this this seems to be a very good moment to, to reflect on this incredibly important topic of housing and um, to some of us houses as well. Um, this in fact has been also a very uh, uh, persistent pursuit and topic from the beginning of our office. Um, and so we're, I'm very glad to contribute to this conversation. But before maybe we talk about the project of the housing and houses, I want to just uh, give you uh, share a little bit of uh, the history of uh, our office um, that might also frame um, and give context of how why we approach housing and houses in the particular way that we do. Um, as Neil and Jay both uh, mentioned in the beginning that we started our office in 2008 and in 2009 we were uh, already asked to do a retrospective which in hindsight well even at that moment we knew it was uh, quite uh, intentional to ask a young firm to look at their the genesis with the starting point of their practice um, with a more retrospective uh, view um, and being really looking at critically um, at your own intentions and thinking about what if you are placing your uh, view 10 years from, from that point, uh, looking back, what do you want to say to out to, uh, to the world and how do you build out your um, practice in that way? So we called this retrospective in the second year of our office, Future Archaeology, particularly for that reason, to really kind of place, place ourselves in the eye of the future and looking at you know, uh, the projects and, and looking at them critically. And so fast forward a few years later, um, almost a decade later, we came out with the, the book, uh, uh, the, our first mon monograph called The um, Solid Objectives, uh, Water Edge Aura. Um, it was not really a book about the project, but really about the ideas. Um, it, it seems we have accumulated by then um, projects. Many of them are small uh, installation projects, some of them our slightly bigger project, but it was a really productive period for us to test those ideas that we have identified in the beginning of our career, the ones that we wanted to experiment and explore and see how they materialized and projected themselves onto the world. So it was kind of a messy picture book with some essays. Um, and we also tried to distill the tenets of architecture that uh, through which we, we worked through these ideas. Um, the water and edge and aura were the three terms that we ended up with. Um, and water speaks to, uh, you know, the, one of the most fundamental acts of architects is to draw plans and draw sections and give some kind of uh, order to, to space and time. And we often start with straight lines, we often start with grid, and, um, and even when we start with something more organic and more fluid, um, you end up having to rationalize it with a, a structural grid when we get to the, uh, the implementation stage. But so uh, we have been from the beginning uh, trying to question that preconceived order and question those um, fundamental unit and the fundamental kind of underlying orders of um, our practice and seeing how um, well, maybe through a different way of uh, moving through space and thinking about the kinetics of the structures that we're able to draw a different kind of plans that allows those, the objects and the lives that go through it to interact with with each other differently. Um, and that might be more uh, akin to the experience that we actually have with the natural world and also in the kind of a post uh, modern world where, where there are many multiple histories and multiple stories that interact with each other and nothing is as singular and universal as 
some might uh, tend to, to think it's very complex and it's very dynamic um, uh, orders that we experience every day. And that uh, was a project that maybe from the beginning in one of our early projects already manifests itself in, in the sense that um, in this pole dance project um, at the PS1 as part of the, this young architect um, program, that we took the Cartesian grid and uh, made this series of uh, columns and, and the beams with elastic members. So the columns are made of PVC pipes and they're set on um, a surfing mast base. And then the beams are made of uh, basically a, a bungee cords that, who, that are also elastic. So as a spatial um, enclosure, but also as a spatial kind of order, it, it in itself is elastic and weak and interconnected with each other and um, none of the columns would stand by itself. They would just flat, uh, fall flat on the ground. So it's it's the interconnectedness that make them into, um, into this very dynamically um, evolving and moving system. So within that, um, within that uh, 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 insulation, it stood about uh, four months during the summer in the courtyard of a PS1, and there were many uh, collaborations with dancers, with DJs, and with art installations that were um, artists and performers who, who were all very inspired by, by this kind of environment and really um, inspired them to create unique work within this environment, which was very encouraging as a first project for us um, to, to really kind of start that exploration. And then shortly after that, we um, started to work on this project uh, at the UC Davis, California. Um, it's a part, it's called the Manitou Shem Museum. And that's the first museum, art museum on the campus of UC Davis. Um, the, project, uh, the, the project is a collection of galleries, but also teaching um, seminar rooms and um, it's it's open to the entire campus population population it's at the end edge of the campus the site is twice as big as the enclosed programmatic requirement so uh, and it's a design build project so the rational thing to do is to to make the project um, you know, as small as possible, as compact as possible, but we took a slightly different route by, um, you know, just expanding the entire, like, um, expanding the project to take over the entire site, but not building um, an enclosure underneath this grand canopy, as we called it, um, everywhere. Um, but then the canopy was able to mediate and uh, articulate different uh, kind of microclimate um, underneath it, even when there's no building enclosure underneath. So the project, um, it's the, the but by, by, by drawing this fluid lines, we were also, it was our intention to, to connect to the rest of the campus, not only from only the entry of the building, but also surrounding it in many different uh, uh, facades or not facade, but like the edge of the canopy so that we can draw the visitors really deep into the plan and from the heart of this site uh, go into the building enclosures themselves. And similar to the PS1, the project was very engaging to the artistic communities, both on campus and also around the campus. There are a lot of uh, commissioned and, the, you know, uh, um, bespoke work that was created um, at the place and um, the big courtyard, well not court, the forecourt um, that's covered by the canopy effectively became a, almost a student um, center that they would uh, organize um, uh, movie nights underneath it and there was a lot of parties and even um, some hip-hop uh, dancing group was uh, using it always as a um, as a performance space. And uh, um, so by kind of giving more and more generosities to, to the space uh, around the building itself, but, but also generosity in, in uh, 
creating spaces that are not architecturally completely hermetically sealed, but are more open to surrounding, I think we were able to actually make the building more active than what the original programmatic requirement was um, giving us. Um, and, but I think, uh, you know, not only the project on the outside, the project on the inside, where uh, on the, even with quite orthogonal, um, sometimes we do need to work with the very orthogonal buildings and the orthogonal plans. And this is a, one of the proposals we did for a continue, well, the expansion of the existing museum in Belgium. Uh, and the existing building is uh, just half of this model. And it had already a uh, structurally um, um, loaded to kind of given um, walls. And so our expansion was uh, the idea was to continue this walls, but then pursue kind of really creating different set of um, uh, openings that is different from the current enfilade of the museum and locating these openings at the corners um, of the building. We were able to kind of curate the movement through this spatial um, order that are quite orthogonal in a much more um, associative and fluid and uh, um, um, exploratory way that you're always um, arriving at a place but then presented with two or three different options to move forward um, so the the experience is never kind of repetitive and marching down and the same same idea we kind of try to use that quite often in many of the exhibition designs that we create um, because the Z33 project was not um, realized so, um, but it's still a very productive way of thinking about how body moves through space and where the opening and where the solid, um, you know, happens. And by just kind of thinking about that, we can curate a completely different experience um, to to the space. And that also allow us to think about how sectionally we organize the program. For example, in this project um, proposal, we were um, trying to bring two organizations together. One is art institution, and then the other one is the cinema. And kind of uh, creating this uh, center space that really became the ch mixing chamber where two very different mediums and very different um, organizations and very different um, an audience can mix and that middle mixing chamber can be the place that uh, to the two um, audience and organizations and activities can both claim and sometimes they may coexist and sometimes it's just um, you know being adjacent to each other having that kind of heightened influence of, uh, of each other so those orders um, are in kind of internally motivated and initiated and how then they uh, express themselves when they start to occupy space in the context and how do they negotiate then with the surroundings is something that we also very much think about and that we call it the second topic, the edge, which um, is one uh, um, one reference that we always go back to is this Engawa idea of in the Japanese architecture. Florian and I both spent a lot of time in Japan and in our kind of early adulthood. Um, and we both worked for Asana um, for a um, number of years. So it's um, it's quite an influential kind of uh, uh, place for, for us. And this Katsula Villa um, is uh, uh, one of the, I would say, um, important reference for even early modernists like uh, Corbusier or um, Walter Gropius and uh, Bruno Tato, they all went to Katsuna Villa. This, this, this is kind of on the outskirts of Kyoto and uh, had, a, had a, quite a bit of reference in the writings on them as, uh, as inspiration for them. And this kind of restrained and very, very reductive uh, order of uh, the architecture. And as many of you know, that uh, the Japanese architecture, um, especially on the inside, is often arrived, uh, derived from this idea of the ma, the tatami, which is a, a, a dimension that's derived from the bodily dimension and the everyday activities. But then, um, then there's also this motif of the garden and this space of, of um, 
the metaphor of the natural and spiritual world that um, are on the outside. And, um, and then there's this space in between, it's called Engawa, um, which is very beautifully captured in this, uh, this view. It's basically the extension of the interior, the architectural space. And then from there, you are looking at the nature from a distance and kind of media, me, meditating on that. And then that Engawa often is also a place of circulation. It's a place um, of activities when the weather is good. So this is kind of in between space is very productive for us to think about that is neither here or there inside or outside, and it's also a place where it can be reflective as well as relating to the everyday. So for us, this Engawa has been also a project, um, a, a space that has been recurring in, in our architecture. In this uh, Kutcha Gallery, for example, we took that in between space and. Uh, actually move the, the the program that are not, this is a for contemporary art gallery and it's nested in a very historically sensitive neighborhood with a lot of uh, Hanuk homes, which is this traditional Korean homes and it's right across the street from the Imperial Palace. So it's a very historical neighborhood. And then we were asked to insert this uh, contemporary art gallery, which wants to have the biggest um, you know, column free space. So we kind of uh, answered to that programmatic demand, but then pushed all the accessory programs like the vestibule or the mechanical unit or elevator shaft to that space um, on the outside of this gallery box and then enveloped it uh, with this chainmail mesh, which becomes like a cloth of the, of the body. Um, of the gallery, and then that, that space starts to take on its own forms and its own characteristics and it becomes occupiable in certain areas as well. So this kind of in-between space it become, became also a very productive negotiator of this very rational order of the, the inside and the very kind of historical and the sensitive context on, on the outside. And because of the last city that the material was able to take on, we were able to give it a bit more crafty and more fluid and more elastic expressions that uh, negotiated between the, the big gallery box and the very kind of traditional context. And then the last theme that um, has always been on our mind is this idea of aura and the, the idea of um, some kind of projection of an, a body toward the outside world and how do we understand those that aura and through the lens of architecture often um, form and order we already talked about it but there's another level of uh, looking very closely at the object itself and not only with our eyes but also with our hands touching it and maybe also conversing with each other so that um, this aura there's also imaginative dimension um, to it that if you perceive something in certain ways and I perceive something in a, the same thing but in a very different ways and we kind of exchange ideas and converse about it then a new kind of imagination um, and then a more expanded imagination that goes beyond the sensorial um, kind of uh, start to exist in the collective um, collective sense so and which is beautifully I think um, and depicted in this artwork um, of the blind man and an elephant, the Grashomon kind of um, effect. So we also think very much about the materiality, the textility, and the labors, and all this um, other dimension that is very much about the hands and about the people and about you know the, the, this the act of building and the act of touching um, and this kind of really tactile dimension of architecture quite seriously. And, you know, uh, one of our um, uh, favorite architect is Nina Bobardi, who um, migrated from Italy to Brazil, but, uh, and was working on many of these quite high modern um, programmatic uh, projects. Um, but then, you know, also working very, very closely with the craftsmen and the builders um, in, in the country, and both kind of experimenting together what this modern language is um, 
uh, and, and, and also kind of continue in many of the crafts and experimenting those crafts inside the buildings itself. So you often hear that she would live on, on one building site like Sesc or this theater that she did in, in Sao Paulo for, you know, the extended period of time and just really working with the, the people who build it on site and kind of figuring out all the details and and you see that in the building as well so i mean for creature gallery um, for example we uh, presented to the client this uh, kind of amorphous elastic clothes for for the building um, but what the, the only way that we can actually bring this craft that is not at the scale of architecture is at the scale of the body to to um, realization is to really work very closely with people who make it. We found a group of uh, welding workshops in a village in China who were entertaining our crazy ideas and uh, you know um, uh, hand welded and polished 500,000 rings together. We had to uh, rent the local um, school's backyard to make a mock-up. So every step was uh, in provision. There's nothing specified um, from the beginning and working closely both with engineers and fabricators and, uh, and the client as well to, to uh, make this quite unconventional facade to come, come to life. And not always that we work with materials that are unconventional and requires a kind of reinvention of every step of the way. Sometimes actually working with quite simple and common materials, we also try to make them um, in, in a way that uh, stops people's uh, um, stops people's uh, um, uh, like reaction to it. You know, like it's sometimes you see things in using the very convention no way you don't pay attention to them, but when they're done in slightly different way, they, it, even for non-architects, you stop and you you uh, react to it and you start to question and you start to be enticed by it. So for example, this project that we just finished in Brooklyn in not so far from our office, it's a situated, it's an art campus situated in a quite industrial and rough neighborhood. And most of the buildings are built by con with concrete and brick CMU blocks and um, metal sidings. So from the beginning, we knew that those are the language and the materiality and tactility we wanted to engage with. So one of the first thing we did was to kind of make a mock-up of the um, one to one mock up of the material palette that we might deploy inside the building, which is the picture you see here on the right. And so the building is uh, actually uh, the project is three buildings. So each building um, deploys a different set of materialities. This one um, was a nod to Nina Bobardi, a potato window that she also had in the Sesc building. Um, but th this is uh, made out of concrete. So we, we created the datum at a human scale and street scale that is just a simple concrete and above that something that has um, more of a refined um, grain and foam work um, lining that uh, creates a more um, detailed uh, detail in the, those brutalist um, textures. And then um, this one, the second building is made out of all this chips and brick, but we rolled it rotated them and so that even around the corner you never see the edge in that very kind of crisp way and so I, although it's a brick it's very fuzzy in a sense um, that's similar to the gypsum as well that it's it's a block but that there's a lot of articulation on the surface so the light really can permeate um, behind the kind of surface of the, the outer surface of the material and then on top is this aluminum bars that are um, aligned together and create a more kind of reflective surface on top of that brick surface. And then the third building was a renovation of a countertop um, um, manufacturer. And uh, we, we basically continued to that brick uh, texture that was or originally in this building, but then um, flipped it uh, backwards so that what you see here is the brick uh, flipped 
use the backwards that all the coursing um, in the back is exposed in the front. And so by doing that, um, you start to lose the scale of the brick and it becomes something much more refined. And what you see in the, in the the foreground here is uh, how the sidewalk concrete um, transitions to the in interior concrete, and we uh, used this uh, squeaking um, brush um, um, to to work really kind of um, on site, you know, in real time with uh, the concrete pores to create these um, patterns on the ground that also um, transition or like basically scraped the foot um, of the people so that while they're walking, it, it's a kind of the addition to the walk of mat that um, that created that transition surface between the sidewalk and the gallery on the inside. And then we also created a series of um, uh, courtyard inside the space. So the context is quite rough and um, to really to give uh, more of a tranquility and uh, um, a place that the artists and the visitors can uh, settle down and, and be kind of um, in, in a more protected environment to, to face and enjoy the artwork and the performances here. Um, we kind of opened the inside of the building up to, to the element again and uh, created courtyard. And on the interior as well, and it's using a quite a simple set of materials. So what you see here is acoustic um, chips and board that um, you typically see in the ceiling, but we use that is, uh, both in the ceiling and the walls so that this texture that's both performative um, becomes also informative of the character of the space. And what you see here is a, um, a waiting room with hand out space for the artists in residency, which is also the materials you see behind me in, in our phone booth. Um, this kind of uh, uh, very thickened uh, felt uh, lining. So those are maybe I can just give you a context of the, the um, topics and the things that we focus on as architects in our buildings and why we focus on them. And um, we work a lot with art space and institutional um, clients, but from the beginning, we've also been very much uh, you know, involved in the thinking about housing and domestic space and the modes of living, because this is the, everyone touches this kind of domestic space and very few have even the chance to question it because it's being uh, it's being uh, produced, it's being um, you know sold to us um, on the market, it's being uh, regulated by, by all kinds of policies. So it doesn't feel like something. Although it's something so intimate and so personal, it's really hard to question a lot of the ground rules for for housing and houses, which is something that we tried to do from the beginning of our office, and it's only recently that we were able to create some more large scale housing project, but it's a topic that we investigated from the beginning. And in fact, that, that I've been kind of reading and, and researching about even where the house comes from as a terminology, because as Chinese, I know that uh, we used to call the house Wu, which is um, um, and it, which is basically a term for, for the roof. And so you live under the roof and um, the house is a very different, has a diff very different uh, meaning linguistically. So I did some just digging in what, what the, the term, what, where did the term house come, came from? And in fact, it's a Germanic, um, high German term, term. And it used to refer to um, storage for grains and animal stocks. So um, people didn't live in kind of the house and in the German sense back then. And in fact, you know, uh, the French called their um, domestic space in its own, which is a place to remain. Um, and uh, Italian had different uh, reference to it. So I think uh, it's quite important to dwell on the fact that 
um, you know, the, the house as we know it, this typology with the corridor and the rectangular boxes, and you go through this shared corridor and very functional space, and then you kind of open a door, and then you go in and you shut the door, and then, then you're in this isolated space, and then you come out, you know, this kind of mechanistic transition between that corridor and the the um, box uh, rectangular space that is very passive is something that we have to kind of reflect and, and think about the consequence of adopting the house as the typology that, that that's so ubiquitous and accepted um, as the norm these days. And um, so a few years back, we have uh, we worked on this uh, um, exhibition called the Home Futures. Uh, at the Design Museum in London, and it was a very um, interesting experience as <clears throat> uh, as we kind of looked together with the curators at, at the, this collection of projects in the recent and kind of late modernist um, period and thinking kind of what were the questions that people raised uh, on these topics and what is, are the contemporary um, issues that we're all confronted with. Um, so uh, there are here are just a few uh, examples that I came across um, through this uh, through this show and writing about it um, in the catalog uh, that I find um, that we find uh, quite relevant and productive in our practice to think about. Uh, one is this Tanigawa House um, by um, uh, by Kanzo Shinohana, which is uh, who's a uh, post-war Japanese architect that very much was concerned with um, the, in the kind of the modern modernist uh, modernist kind of conversion of Japan post-war Japan into something that many people didn't recognize at that time, and how the architectural space and this urban space was radically transformed and, and its impact on the psyche. So he made this. He designed this um, house for a poet, Tanikawa, and uh, the, so behind this white wall that you see is a very small, um, kind of almost a, a winter cabin, so to say, um, very condensed, a very efficient slivers of programs on two floors of the bedrooms and the, and the bathrooms and such, and, and, and then four times bigger than that space is this naked space he called it, which is this big empty space that is following the slope of the mountains where this um, house is situated and the entire floor is dirt and there's nothing in it except the view towards um, the downhill and the uphill and this ladder to nowhere and the expressiveness of this um, wooden structure in the middle. Um, and there are some other projects so like the Hans Mayer's um, radical kind of proposition that the the, um, the house, the, the domestic realm needs to become much more reduced and it's think, thinking about the kind of the, the minimal, you know, needs that we have as human beings or this Hugo La Plata, who is um, uh, a designer who uh, did a really humorous series of uh, videos um, from in the 70s of him kind of devising objects that you can bring with you and occupy the streets and occupy the domestic realm, I mean the public realm into a domestic space and really kind of using that series of objects to push against the, the um, the top-down um, planning and the rationality of a state, um, the state kind of uh, urban space. And there's also a series of projects uh, that women and women architects and designers have been thinking about the domestic spaces uh, um, uh, relationship to how women are seen and how our sensorial and biological needs um, are imposed or um, constrained in this um, domestic space. For example, um, this, uh, on the left, you see this um, uh, Lithuanian-born American artist, um, Alexander Kasuba, who made this uh, um, her apartment in, in New York into this 
very elastic and stretch using stretched fabric to really kind of make a domestic realm that is all about the sensorial her sensorial needs and she really wanted to break away from the 90 degree angle and the box space where um, on top this uh, a series of the installation by Toyoito but really by Sejima at that time as she was working for Toyoito in the 80s it's called um, dwellings for Tokyo nomad women and that's when you know in the 80s in the bubble um, Japan women were getting a lot of jobs and and becoming financially independent and starting to have ambitions beyond the, the domestic realm and they can kind of go out into the to the societies and they become you know they're they're uh, similar to Lugula Pieta's um, sense that they have their uh, needs and objects kind of becoming their their domestic space and be can, can be simply deployed into the world and into the society and um, occupy that that space. And that, that space is also quite translucent and elastic and, uh, and soft. Um, and then there are also, uh, at the beginning of last century, a series of um, experimentations about co-kitchen, uh, the efficiency of the kitchen, and how do we make those chores more efficient so that there could be more leisure space, uh, leisure time for women, and uh, how do we pull resources together and create like a co-housing typologies so that, um, you know, the, the domestic um, labors can be can be rethought of um, in those kind of ways. So those series of projects are all in the past and we, we um, as architects of today are also concerned about things that are very particularly um, of our times and one of them is the environment and the pollutions. So we've done a few projects um, that kind of speaks to the building's uh, impact and that even the, the, the domestic spaces, uh, the production of houses and domestic spaces, uh, this material practice is the impact on, on, on the environment itself. Uh, I think 60% of the um, building industry is for private homes. Uh, well, for, for, for the residential market. And um, I think in 2020 alone, in, in the US alone, um, there was 200 billion uh, insurance claim that was, um, that was uh, lost basically um, on houses. And uh, you know, that was lost to extreme weather, basically climate change. And there's only 300 billion um, a new construction. So, you know, we're basically losing more than half of the value of, of the, uh, the, what we're building as new to, to this climate issues um, and climate change. So it's a really important thing to think of, reflect on why do we build so much and why do we kind of not take care of the larger environment as a whole um, and, as a starting point of thinking about the domestic realm. This is a project that we did in um, Chicago Biennial a few years back, kind of looking really at um, our body's relationship with the environment. What is the minimal footprint we need to inhabit um, the space? And created a microclimate around us. In this case, it's actually uh, a performance project that the wind instruments um, performance were we tailor made these costumes around them. So this kind of minimal architectural space, and each of this tailored um, piece are uh, designed for the instruments movement. And so they are. Um, they're specific to, to how much space that particular instrument would need, similar to every idiosyncratic individual's um, domestic living needs as well. And then we made uh, this uh, material, this uh, costumes out of the material of the um, HVAC filters, so, so that it, as a as an object, it's also a medi mediation between us and the environment beyond. And then we scaled this project up to a kind of experimental prototype project that we did for the Mini um, Mini Living, the, the car company Mini, um, that had this series of projects that they experiment with the idea of, um, of, of domesticity as 
well. So um, we scaled it up and this is a kind of a three-story little tower that was made by this uh, Japanese uh, um, material that uh, attracts the heavy metals and pollutants in the air and then um, let it to kind of wash off. And um, you know, so the, the material itself um, is also deployed to, to be able to clean the air to a certain extent. So this, this um, uh, structure uh, is quite translucent and it doesn't um, enclose. It's more like a membrane rather than an enclosure and this kind of very solid uh, construction. And there's no really furniture in it and every you know surfaces does something of either light coming through or you can sleep or on it. So obviously this is not um, all practical, um, but it's a really more of an experimentation of thinking about what is the minimal uh, need that we we have to occupy or um, to habit our environment. And in doing so, well, how can we also give back and have a positive impact to, to the surroundings, um, the context that we densify and occupy in? Um, so those are the, some of the early um, experimentations and just kind of thinking about this uh, environment. And this project is uh, one of our first um, ground up housing project in, in um, New York, in Brooklyn, and it's uh, about to complete and the residents about to move in. And in New York, most of the houses or condos are made in this uh, uh, double loaded corridor. And then you are, you have a, you know, doorman lobby or some kind of amenity on the ground floor and then you take the elevator or um, to go up and then you have this double this corridor and you've got 80%, um, you know, close to 80% efficiencies of your sellable uh, square footage versus the building square footage as a, as a residential development. And that's basically a formula has never been questioned in the last couple of decades. And we were working with this new uh, developer who are both architects and uh, um, to really think about this was already pre pre pandemic pre pandemic and we were already very much talking about that uh, the building needs to engage the environment so the residents need to have fresh air and they need to engage with their neighbors even in the denser urban environment where you know you're not um, kind of, you don't have shared garden or anything um, and the, the corridor is a space um, that cannot be reduced to its minimum becoming this inhumane space and it needs to be this social realm so our idea is to have each of the apartment to have not only one um, orientation or one window, which is most of the New York condos are, but they have at least three exposures and sometimes even four exposures. And rather than this double loaded corridor, we opted for more of a vertical, almost a kind of circulatory uh, common space in the middle that also is the main um, circulation between the buildings, um, between the units themselves. So from the outside, everyone has basically at least two terraces that looks out to, to the street. And then in between these units, um, there's this quite uh, fluid and uh, sculptural um, uh, corridors that, that connect them together and um, it's also where they can see into each other's apartment to a certain extent and can it's a really nice place to to stop on your way to your apartment it's all it's covered but not not enclosed and you can um, um, you know chat and mingle with, with your neighbors. And so, although you know in New York the space is precious, we were able to create this very different typologies um, in, in Brooklyn, and um, we're doing two other uh, development with the same developer adhering to the same principle that we will never do interior double the corridor and every apartment needs to have this uh, two or three exposures and outdoor space being really the main 
um, collective space, the social space, but also the place that every individual can connect to their environment um, in their daily life. And when you arrive at the um, apartment, you're not going into an interior, you know, doorman, um, you know, amenity space, but you're walking to a shared garden space um, as your arrival to the home. And similarly, we uh, were thinking, we applied the same thinking to this uh, um, prototype project in Leon, Mexico. Um, this work came about um, as part of a laterally concerted effort by the city of Leon to um, reverse this kind of um, urban sprawl that has gone really unchecked and created a devastating environmentally. Um, a negative impact in the region because the urbanization that's happening um, in, in Mexico and because of the, uh, ur the housing development policies um, since the 70s has been imposed on the federal level and they just give this uh, loan to low income populations and then um, the, the, the developers take them and they just blanket the entire country with this very rapidly deployed and simple, um, cheaply built housing um, that takes up the original uh, um, farmland. And, um, and this is not only in Mexico, it happens in China in many parts of the world as um, in the last couple of decades. And because of the sprawl and the low dense use of this uh, um, kind of development, and there's no, not enough social amenities and infrastructures in these places, not trash pickups, no schools, no recreational facilities, no hospitals. So it's both socially unsustainable and environmentally very negative. So what we have, and you know, as I mentioned, that this is not only happening in, in Mexico, but in many other parts of the world, including this country as well. So what we did is to work with the city and the housing um, department of the city to kind of really look at a series of sites within the city that can be densified and have good access to social infrastructures like schools and play, playgrounds and hospitals and such. And like also studying like what would be the right density and what would be the right um, price point for construction and for, for the population we're targeting with the city together. So it's a very kind of locally initiated um, um, uh, effort rather than this top-down federally um, initiated effort. effort. Um, and that's why you're able to actually um, kind of get into the specificity of the site and the specificity of the population itself. Most of the uh, residents in our project makes less than $7,000 a year and they, um, they engage in uh, informal economies. So, so this will be the first time that they enter into a more kind of formalized economy. The typology that we proposed was similar to the, to the Brooklyn house um, that I just showed. <clears throat> that instead of the double to the corridor, we use the corridor as this social space and also kind of in the Mabius strip configuration, um, looped it uh, around itself so that it would broke down this massive um, housing development into kind of smaller chunks. So there's a bigger courtyard and a smaller courtyard. This is about 70 units, 68 units a house. Um, and the building does not, is not kind of a simple repetition of the boxes that creates a rectangular floor plan, but it starts to, you know, become more fluid and kinetic in, in that sense. And we were able to vary its, um, a different height uh, around the a site so that you can look into the building in a, in a more kind of um, engaging way. And the plans are um, done in, in such a way that um, there's the, this common space sometimes loops on the inside of the buildings and sometimes on the outside of the buildings to really bring the residents in and out to, to this whole development. And in the middle, there are common space that are also inserted into the volume as the voice where people can hang out and do more social things together. Um, so this was the, our uh, first rendering and we, it was very important for us that although the building is quite a low budget, it's $2 million for 70 units. 
um, but we wanted to make sure that it had a pride and it had um, a dignity and it's a design feature. So we proposed to, to, to create this um, precast panel so that's able to rotate and create this uh, more kind of intriguing facade that doesn't feel repetitive and too rational. And then we thought, okay, precast panel should be easy. It was at the time the, war, uh, the wall was erected between um, Mexico and the US. And we thought that let's uh, reach out to some precast panel companies and maybe, maybe get them too busy so that they don't have time to do the walls. Um, but then, you know, we realized that actually most of the pre precast uh, companies in the, in Mexico were not used to this scale of architectural work and, you know, many mock-up ended up being quite a um, disastrous end. So we kind of flipped the whole problems upside down and thought, um, and actually the local kind of architectural department, um, housing architecture department proposed that, why don't you make the CMU block? Um, because everyone, uh, local labor know how to build building with CMU block. Because most, they're mostly used to single or second, you know, or three story buildings that are made out of CMU blocks. So um, precast panel is not something that's, uh, you know, technically it's too, too out there for, for the local kind of building industry. Um, so we basically thought, okay, then, you know, if CMU block is something that everyone knows how to do, and then we can employ actually more people um, through that uh, CMU block construction rather than precast construction, then uh, that might be the answer. So we developed this, this bespoke CMU block that can rotate in many directions. So anyone can put it together, but just, you know, by rotating them differently, they were able to receive uh, the glass panels in different configurations. Um, and it's a very simple process. We, we just need to adhere to the maximum uh, you know, weight of the CMU blocks. And then as a whole, um, they, they created this very similar, but even better um, textures and, um, and the playfulness on the facade of this building. So um, again, you know, this building, I think if you look at it from above, it's a decidedly very different scale than the rest of the city. It's four times denser than the surrounding um, building kind of density. Um, so it assumed a certain institutional kind of scale and presence already. So it was very important for us that the building, you know, the, up close has a certain um, tactility and the details so that um, it, it welcomes people to, to rather than shutting out and really allows people to kind of come closer to them and, and all kinds of activities can, can take place. Uh, the market that was in this neighborhood is becoming three times more um, vibrant um, because of the project's arrival. And they're doing more and more of this similar development in the city of Lyon um, as we speak. Here you can see the scale difference of this building with its surrounding. And um, the hope of, of the city of Lyon is really to densify the city to, to reverse even that uh, urban sprawl that I just spoke about. So that's the last slides and that concludes my lecture. Thanks for uh, thanks for an incredible talk. Um, you're able to uh, discuss uh, really sophisticated and and profound ideas in a way that uh, is incredibly understandable. Uh, like that that talk was amazing, and and the the work the work is amazing as well. Um, I guess I guess what's amazing about the work for me is that, um, is that you you're able to somehow take take um, take a theoretical point. And actually engage it in practice and embody it, and 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 then and then somehow um, favor the experiential dimension. So you, so you talk about how, how people actually understand it as a as a tactile thing that you that's that's for everyone. So incredible work. Uh, we're really really super fortunate to have you, you speak today. Um, today I've, I'm going to uh, introduce um, discussion panel guests. Um, we have uh, we have the esteemed uh, Sasha Radulovich from uh, five four six eight seven nine six Architecture, 
and um, and somebody that works for five, four, six, seven, five, four, six, eight, seven, nine, six. Um, uh, ben Greenwood, uh, who uh, who is the uh, RAC medal winner from a couple of years ago, um, and um, and we're going to open the floor for questions and conversations. And um, uh, I think um, you can indicate in the chat if you have a question. And if you're comfortable, um, um, then you can turn your video on when you're asked to, uh, to, to respond with your question or to, to ask your question. Um, but maybe, um, maybe either Sasha or Ben has a question to start things off. And then, and then we can uh, we can go from there. Ben's well, always had a question. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm gonna put him on spot on the spot. Sure. Um, I I guess the way you kind of walked us through some of those projects, it felt like there was some phases to your office, maybe in terms of differentiation and scale, or in in, in size of project, or or the type of clients. Is is that um, is that what you guys see your future right now? Is, is it housing and, and projects like the last one that you've done? Um, I think there are two types of projects that we feel very passionate about. Um, and there are other types of projects that are interspersed in, in the middle. But I think more consistently, we've been thinking about housing. We've been thinking about the institutional and the cultural project that, uh, because of their um, I would say connectedness with everyone. Um, the fact that everyone has to live and the fact that everyone should have access to our cultural, collective cultural heritage and um, should participate in that conversation. I think those are the two projects that we feel uh, is the most productive and the most, um, I would say like uh, rewarding project for us to work on. Uh, we had more luck with culture clients from the beginning and very little luck with housing client clients for a very long time. But that didn't uh, discourage us from continuing to do that. Um, uh, you know, I think housing is, uh, is something that just has much more uh, constraints that we have to work one project at a time to try to change the conversation. Um, um, but uh, we're hopeful that uh, people have their ears open these days more than before. So. Mm. How many, uh, how many uh, colleagues do you have? How, many, how big is the office? Um, we fluctuate somewhere between 15 to 25, I would say. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah, that sounds familiar. Well, the other thing that I picked up is it seems like you spend a lot of time on site, which I think is, um, which is pretty neat. Um, maybe it was just those photos that you were showing, but... Uh, like some of that kind of bespoke work where it was just almost like uh, you or a colleague standing over the shoulder of the guy who's about to travel the ground, you know, and, and uh, making like having that direct translation, like just so that nothing got lost in, in drawings. That's does that still happen? Even well, though, I mean, yeah. I think that, well, everyone in our office, um, yeah, just kind of really like building things and like to get our hand dirty. Um, you know, even during the design process, we build a lot of models and big scale models, um, experiment with them. Um, I, I don't believe designing in, in computer alone. Um, I think once you make things with your hand, you think with your hands as well. And then, then somehow that translates with building with your hands and thinking with your hands in the later stage. Um, there's a lot of things. It also allows us to um, experiment. I think when you're only designing in the computer, you, you rely on what Google, you know, returns to you as a references or like the spec book that you can find in the catalog, you know, like, so there are this kind of underlying, uns, you know, spoken constraints um, through the digital um, tools itself. Um, and it's good to, to kind of try to just let this process of, you know, building models and building you know, uh, big mockups uh, to take you to a place that those digital tools don't allow you. But I think we, we shift back and forth. I think you make something that um, that wouldn't be possible in the digital with the digital tools, and then you try to rationalize it and understand it um, with the digital tools. So it's kind of a back and forth process. Thank you. Yeah, to, to build on Neil's sort of comments, it, it's, I feel envious 
and uh, at the same time, I want to know how and what, and, and you know what, and no more, because you've touched on it. There, there's there's obviously a certain fascination with geometry from the get go, and I think we don't we don't learn enough about geometry in uh, in architecture. I think geometry is is can be a starting point to, to many a thing, and I, I I enjoy that. I enjoy playing with geometry myself as uh, as well. The uh, there is a certain clarity of thought, both when it comes to, as, as Neil mentioned, both from theoretical to practical considerations when it comes to, when it comes to geometry, but also use of materials and, uh, and, uh, and the nature you, you, you approach that and so on. And so I'm sure it's evolving, uh, but you, you bring certain proclivities, uh, you and Florian, into, into the practice and so on. And it's, it's sort of great to see it uh, deployed in different, uh, in different typologies across the continent, um, you know, in different ways of, of asking the, I'm not sure if it's asking the same questions, but asking similar questions along the same lines and so on. Do you ever find it confining? Because I, I struggle, you know, we had in our office a ban on, Use of core ten for two years because we we found ourselves having used it, you know, on too many projects at some point. So you ever find uh, they find those limitations because I would wish that the limitations would define one's work uh, uh, much more than they do uh, these days. So I don't know if I'm making myself clear what what the question is or comment. I don't think materially we're we're confined to one thing actually. No, I don't think you are. Um, but you, your your approach is actually so so adaptable to different materials that that's what I'm really uh, that's what I'm really enjoying. And so looking from outside, I'm just asking because I we find ourselves confined by a variety of, of our own proclivities. So I'm just wondering does that hit 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 your process at all or you just find yourself like swimming in this water fluidly? I think that maybe materially we're pretty exploratory and um, it's continually expanding, you know, like there are certain definitely, you know, preferences of, a, you know, we like metals that are shinier than dollar, you know, like there are certain just very subjective things. Um, mm -hmm. but like we can all do psychoanalysis of why we like them, but let's stop there, you know, and, <laughs> and just say that, you know, we, we like what, the effect that they produce. And, you know, we move from glass to wood to concrete. And so I don't think materially we feel so confined. And in fact, every, every building, we try a different kind of material that with structural system that we don't know so much about. And, you know, it becomes also a very, a very good inquiry for us to gain new knowledge. So that's not, I, we never feel confined, but I do feel that geometrically, we have a certain, almost like we're like stuck to certain principles that we feel like there's not enough people doing those things in the world. There's like a lot of people knowing how to do, you know, well calibrated mm -hmm. that grid lines and all those things, you know, we don't have to be the ones that you know, contribute to that because there's a lot of very good designer doing that already that we feel like, okay, you know, we have to do something different and just because not so many people are doing that. Um, and then sometimes we feel like, oh, you know, it doesn't, it's not, not that easy in every project, you know? So sometimes like, oh, how do we do that in this project? And that becomes a maybe confining moments. Um, but I think, you know, we, we um, to a very degree, some project that we look at the plans and look at the, the volume, we're like, oh, that really didn't come through very well. You know, if there are projects that we know, <laughs> come through very well. and, you know, and sometimes it comes through very well. So um, it's a, it's a hit and miss when it right. comes to geometry. That's a harder right. one. Back. You know what, the, the thing that, uh, honestly, I've, I've woken up in sweat multiple times in the last year as I was old watching your museum in Brooklyn come together and it's and this has a sort of a background in conversations we have in the office quite often which is as architects training teaches us teaches us to rationalize things and we can certainly over rationalize them and the uh and then we lose the irrational in the in the projects themselves you know and the perfect examples of breaking away from that are both Lina Bobardi and maybe uh, maybe Le Corbusier, right? There's also those moments they're like, well, what the hell does this have to do with anything, right? And then you realize it provides a perfect counterpoint to the uh, 
to the sort of rational mind that created the 95% of the building, right? So potato shaped window and so on. So the, uh, there's that wall, uh, I think it's at the entrance where it sort of wants to be soft curve, but it isn't. So you broke, broke the, uh, with brick, you broke it. Um, and I, I've been like one day I wake up and thinking, well, that was a mistake. And the other day I think it's a genius because it's exactly that irrational component. And I, I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about, but it's basically a steel wall that kind of bends inwards, but it doesn't bend in a smooth curve. It kind of has a kink in it. And the, uh, so how do you keep that irrational in, in the design? And especially when you get to, into housing and, and something that sort of mandates more of a repetition. I don't know if you think about it that way ever. Well, I think that often we, we look at it not, I don't know if it's about rationality, it's more about what kind of um, space and what kind of um, movement and uh, relationship with the context those things will produce. Because you cannot rationalize them. You have to just look at them and appreciate them and say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm really good way to walk into a building where that's a really good way to look through the lot and through all these shapes and you know across so it's more about appreciating what they produce in the world but rather than like finding out why they have to be there because right right well it's a whimsy right that you you, you sort of have to maintain but if, if you're trying to rationalize everything there's a danger of it actually never finding a way into the project Jing, you, um, you, you elucidated us a little bit in terms of how, how your office works, that you, you work in some analog form and you build lots of mock-ups and, and uh, you like uh, sort of thinking through drawing and, and those things are fantastic. And you, um, you seem like such a gentle but strong-willed <laughs> and, and strong person. Um, I'm just I'm just wondering how you somehow um, wrangle fifteen to twenty five people in a way in a way that uh, like how how do you work how do you, how does your office work in terms of in terms of maybe um, talk a little bit about politics or about how how things sort of unfold like how 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 you're able to sort of still make really strong work and and have all sorts of participation and and engagement and stuff. Uh, wow, that's a load of the question. <laughs> it's, it's all very intuitive. I think we have a quite um, non-hierarchical office. Um, definitely there are people that are more senior, have more experience, and they, um, they, have, they assume positions that are um, more kind of mentor to young staff where they, they you know, are put in front of the client and have to take on more responsibilities. Um, but I think we, we do that pretty early on. Like if you work in our office for two, three years, you, you are, you know, you, you are going to be responsible for a project. It might be a small project, but, um, you know, we don't have staff that are just, um, you know, making models or doing, you know, CD set. Um, everyone, I, I believe that, uh, you know, I think Florian believes it too, that um, architecture is this juxtaposed trade, it's a generous, that you have to work with the client and be able to articulate the idea, not only in the theoretical sense, but also in the kind of accessible, as you mentioned before, everyone who's not architect should understand that there are bigger things at stake here. They don't need to go to art architecture school to understand that we have to question you know the domestic space the rule of the domestic space so we, we try to kind of uh, um, have the the staff to to do that um, but also to look over the shoulder with a bricklayer and try to convince them to do something they've never done before right like so i think from the beginning to the end uh, all of this inform you to be a designer so we do that with all our staff um, and just in terms of idea generation i think by now um, we have a pretty clear project as in the office. Um, and so I would say that most of people who apply to the office, it's quite easy to understand, like, you know, if they get it or not, and, you know, why they're applying and would this be a good um, match or not. So I think uh, most of the people who are in our office, we believe more or less in the same direction um, and in the same way that um, how architecture would, um, how our architecture could develop. So yeah, it's a pretty organic process. <laughs> you don't overthink it. 
you just do it. <laughs> yeah. Any questions from um, from people who are still around? Ted, is that you asking a question? Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I just want to say thanks, Jing Lu. Uh, so Il's work is, um, if I pronounce it right, is so inspiring in, in a lot of ways. Um, and it's exciting to see the expansion into the kind of social justice area, getting into the housing. It's really important for leaders in the design community to point that in that direction because it's been too long ignored. But I, I just wanted to say, I posted in the chat there a recent article that I enjoyed reading uh, in Azure Magazine. And in that article, you talk about the ambiguity a little bit and the quest for meaning and the artistic process. Um, the two of you talk about that. I wonder if you wanna just say a little bit more about this interest in the fuzzy edge of things and the ambiguity and how the pro it's more about the product, uh, sorry, the process, artistic process and collaboration with artists more generally, if you want to speak about that. Thanks for the talk. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think our fascination with um, ambiguity with, we, we were told by our American friend that ambiguity is not a good term in English. We were fascinated with this term until someone told us, don't say that too much because it's not a really good word to use. Um, but I think from the beginning, we were, we were interested in this fuzziness, ambiguity, this destabilizing, softening of the order, as I mentioned in the, in the article, and I think uh, um, consistently you can see throughout our project. Uh, because I think there's this one underlying uh, question we have is that what we know and what we see is not all. And in fact, it's just so little of what it could be. And then there's this much bigger, and maybe, and, you know, in the Katsula Villa, I was trying to hint to that as well. There's this, you know, larger world and more imaginative and um, poetic and things that, you know, world that's much larger than ourselves out there. And we should uh, um, explore, you know, definitely we have to rationalize and we have to build and we have to adhere to the rule of gravities to, to get there, but they're just, try to not forget that there are other things and bigger things than ourselves out there that we, we can get to through very solid. The reason we, we named ourselves um, solid objectives is that there's this kind of objectives that are much more abstract than larger, but also quite, um, you know, we, we have a directionality to it, but we need to kind of you know, solidify them and also kind of use a very tangible and tactile means to get there. Um, and I think, it, you know, being the, making things more fuzzy and dislabelizing and softer and ambiguous is a way to also to get everyone to stop and think, well, this is what you see is not all, you know, there's more to see and then there's more to think and there's more to explore. And I believe that in architectural space, the spaces that we like, um, the buildings that we love going into, it does that to people. Um, and it, you know, those moments in our cities you know, exist everywhere. So we hope that our building also communicates that. I had another question. Uh, I was wondering uh, how much time in, in your design process do you spend unsure of what you're doing? And how much of it uh, do you spend like uh, feeling confident? And I say that because whenever I'm working on anything, I'm always hungry for resolution because I find it so uncomfortable to be in unresolution. Of course, that's not always a good thing to rush to, to resolution. So I was wondering what your process is like. Uh, I think we're always unsure from the beginning to the end. <laughs> um, yeah, like I think, uh, Often it's uh, the deadline of a CD set or a DD set or you know competition that that uh, you know that at some point we have to put pencil down and start to draw a plan. Um, but I think uh, 
you, I, we never feel like, even with the cities that, that you have gotten there, like where it needs to be. And maybe, you know, even after the buildings build, if you feel like, okay, now it's, it's got to li live and then maybe it will get there. Um, and then, so, so the building also doesn't stop at the moment it's constructed, I feel. So um, now I, I think we're never unsure. I mean, I think the direction we have a conviction in, but uh, you know, the never at any moment it's complete, so to say. That seems like a really torturous way to practice because I'm always chasing that way, that like that big relief. You know what I mean? Like that sigh of relief, like, oh, okay, it's working. And the idea that it's you don't get that even till maybe the building's done, I, I don't know if I can handle it. <laughs> So this is the latest um, A plus U monograph um, that uh, we worked on during the pandemic. It's called the Unfinished Business. And because we were talking with uh, our friend, uh, Jeanette and Uno uh, from Switzerland who wrote um, uh, you know, an interview, interviewed us and wrote a piece in there. And then we were just talking about that, that our ideas never finish in one project. You know, like then you don't finish and you continue you explore the same idea and you try to get a little bit better and you try to try different ways in another project. So every project is unfinished business to us. And they, they took that as the title of the monograph. Well, thanks. This is a quick comment. Um, um, the, 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 in the word ambiguity in your practice and, and then it's not, completely out, it's actually ambiguous, meaning it's still intact with certain level of familiarity, which I think is very interesting, and especially pronounced in your social, social housing project in Mexico, where you're, you're working with CMU, which is very familiar with the local labor, but you're, you're slightly making it slightly un unfamiliar, ambiguous for them to work it. So I think that tang tangential twist is very interesting and intriguing for me because Maybe there's a there's a very interesting strategy there in terms of social housing, especially specifically, because you have to work with certain kind of familiarity to invite the local labor. In this case, literally you did, that, you did that, but you also push their kind of excitement through this slightly imagined CMU unit and turning into a completely different kind of outcome. Uh, but in, in fact, in, in technical side of the pr uh, project, there's very clear kind of slab structure and, and registering the certain kind of datum point, but there's a level of unfamiliarity that pushes the project to another, another level of reading in urban sense. So I think that for me, ambiguity is not unfamiliar. It's like in between familiar and unfamiliar to push that boundary, which I think is very interesting strategy conceptually especially in the social realm of the projects, which I really appreciate it. Thank you. I think maybe unless there's any more questions, we'll wrap up. And uh, uh, super thank you for, uh, for such a wonderful talk and wonderful work. And uh, we look forward to seeing more work <laughs> and uh, we look forward to, to, to having you back at some time and maybe, maybe coming to Winnipeg sometime. But th thanks tons. That was that was wonderful. I Thank love the much. snow. So invite me when it's snowing. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect.